we've been looking at Matthew 3, 11 and 12. This is the same one, but from Luke. And uh, I like the way Luke lays this out. It's the same passage, but it's from a, a different. It, Luke, Luke puts a little spin to it that I liked. So we're looking at Luke, the third chapter. We're looking at verses 15 through 17. And we're talking about Jesus' baptism of fire, right? Uh, we, we've been in a series entitled The Baptisms of Jesus. And this is, when we get through it, it'll be our last lesson today. So here are in verses 15 through 17. And while the people were in a state of expectation and all were wondering in their hearts about John as to whether he might be the Christ. That's John the Baptist. John answered and said to them all, as for me, I baptize you with water, but one is coming who is mightier than I. I am not fit to untie the thorns of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. And now he explains the fire. He says, his willowing fork is in his hand to thoroughly cleanse his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn, and he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Okay? Now, what I like, if you read them both together, you probably wouldn't pay that much attention. You'd say, well, gosh, they say the same thing. Yeah, but, John, but Luke puts a little twist to it. For example... He introduces the idea, well, here's verse, here's verse 15, uh, expectations. You remember, see the word, look at verse 15, expectation. See the third, expectation. Now the people were in a state of expectation. Yeah, what, what that means, and, and down to where you and I both live, what this means is that there was an excitement in the atmosphere. There was a buzz going on with John's ministry because he came. He had been, this is the first prophet Israel has had a national prophet in 400 years. And, uh, and he's come and, and he's excited and that has become contagious about the coming of the Messiah, right? He said, listen, I'm here to tell you the Messiah will be here in our lifetime. In fact, he says, I'm telling you something. He's here now, and that's why I baptized with water, right? So what Luke tells us, Matthew didn't, that there was a real excitement in the atmosphere around John's message uh, in Israel. And national prophets had that effect. When, when the national prophet stood up to speak, uh, it was an E.F. Hutton moment, you know. It's one of those deals. Now, in, in, um, and so that's good. And, and, verse, and so they wanted to know, because of the excitement of the coming of the Messiah, they wanted to know, are you, are you the Messiah? Because, but it's probably those who liked his ministry, don't you imagine? <laughs> those who didn't like it, of course, they hoped he wasn't the Messiah because nobody liked him. Um, the other thing in, in verse 16 to 17 to stay with E words is an explanation. We have expectations in 15 and explanation in verse 16, 17. And so look at this. Here, here's how he explains to the people that, you know, he said, look, that's a fair question. That's a good one. But let me explain. He said, uh, as for me, I'm not it. I'm not the, I'm not the one. Uh, I baptize with water. But the one is coming who is mightier than I. And then he tells them, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And that explains the fire. Now, they understand this. They understand this about the Messiah. What they don't understand is that there's going to gap, going to be a gap, a historical gap between the first coming and second coming. They were just looking for the coming of the Messiah. We, you know, we've, if there's probably anything I've pounded lately, it's certainly been that idea. Um, and what we have here. We have the baptism of, the, of Jesus and the Holy Spirit. That's what the church age is all about, and that's where the gap's going to be in the coming of Christ. There's going to be a first coming, a second coming, and the baptism of fire, second coming, right? So we have it here, first coming, second coming, but they didn't know that 
that there was going to be a gap, a historical gap called the church age, because that, that of course, is, is explained in the, under the new covenant as the mystery, isn't it? So, but, uh, and so, look, look and, and here's what, here's what um, Luke is suggesting. He said there, there was a buzz around John. There was an excitement in the atmosphere around John because he preached Christ is coming. Then what John does, John says in, in his ministry, he points to Jesus. He points to Jesus, said, behold, the Lamb of God that's come to take away the sin of the world. There's your Messiah. And the buzz that was around John is now around Jesus. And, and here's what I love about it. And Luke has just opened up the book. You know what the rest of the book of Luke is about? The buzz around Jesus. Isn't that good? I just love that. And, and so I kind, of, I kind of like, well, Matthew is the standard. Matthew 3, 11 and 12 is kind of like the standard for Jesus baptizing with the Spirit. And that's how I gave that to you first. But before I got out of this lesson, I wanted to give you Luke's idea about it. Because he shows the excitement that was around John has now been transferred to Jesus and his disciples and the buzzes around him throughout the rest of the book. And that's a wonderful. And when you study the book of Luke with that idea in mind, you're going to sure see it too. You are going to sure see it by Luke. That's kind of what, you know, every writer kind of has, he's going to tell his stories, but he's going to do it with a flair or with a, something else. Well, that's his. And so it's, it's kind of interesting. Next time you read the book of Luke, kind of keep that in mind. I uh, don't know if you'd be a good book to read, but well, anyhow, let's have a word of prayer and we'll get into our study about Jesus' baptism of fire. This is part two. We've, we've already done study the first study on this. This is number two, and we're going to look at five aspects after a word of prayer. I'll give you a moment of silence. Those who have come by automobile and those who are visiting by internet, we ask you to take the same courtesy. We call it classroom etiquette. Uh, it's a spiritual book, the Bible, for spiritual people, for spiritual living. Um, the Holy Spirit will teach you great truths. It will affect your life and time and eternity and will give you a historical perspective of what uh, John the Baptist was teaching and Jesus Christ is going to fulfill. Half of it's been fulfilled and the other half will be fulfilled. He's already fulfilled. Jesus baptized him with the Holy Spirit. Next on the schedule is him baptizing with fire, and that will be at the second coming. But to get back to the idea, you can't study the Bible. It's a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. If you're carnal, you're, you're a believer. You say, I believe Jesus died for my sins, was buried and raised from the dead on the third day. Well, that is the gospel, and when you believe it, it has the power to save you, Romans 1.16. That's not what, I, what I'm saying. At the moment you believed it, you were indwelt by the Holy Spirit and your body became the temple of God, 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. And that now you have the ability not only to be a spiritual position, a, a spiritual person positionally, but also experientially. When you walk in the Spirit, you're a spir you're, the dynamics of your spiritual life is now manifested both to you and from you. You've got to study the Bible, John 14, 15, and 16. Jesus is teaching about the ministry of the Spirit. When he comes, he will teach you and, 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 and not only teach you, but recall. Yeah, think about that. So what do I have to do? If I'm carnal, there's, that's evidence of personal sin. 1 John 1, 9, if I confess my sin, he's faithful and just to forgive me, and that's protocol. That's, how, that's, that's your preparation. That's classroom etiquette. The sixth, second classroom etiquette is to stay focused during this hour of teaching. If you're not in a place where you can be focused, if, if there's, then, you know, you need to maybe pick this up live stream when you've got a chance to sit down and study for 30 minutes un 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 uninterrupted. Father, we're so thankful tonight for the fact that we can confess our sins, whether it be mental attitude sins, sins of the tongue, overt sins, because of the work of of Christ on the cross in regard to sin has been extended to my life uh, through confession of sin. It brings me back into the fellowship of the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit in the teaching hour. It's essential 
for him to teach me and to recall and to develop spiritual growth momentum in my life. I'm thankful for that principle in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're going to look at um, point number one out of five aspects of Jesus' baptism of fire. And it's to give you a sensible definition, a very general, but a sensible definition, because we've already done point one, uh, or part one of this subject. This is part two. Um, all, and here's what this, here's what this, when you study these two lessons, this is what you'll learn. All living unbelievers will be removed from the earth by Jesus' baptism of fire at the second coming of Jesus Christ. Now, if you have your Bibles, and of course you do, and if you're with us on the internet, always come to the internet with your Bible, just like you would if you came to this church. And so I'm in 2 Thessalonians, I'm in the second chapter, 5 uh, through 10. Do you remember that while I was still with you, I was telling you these things, and you know what restrains him now, so that in his time he may be revealed? For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he's taken out of the way. And he's talking about, you know, the law of lawlessness. He's talking about this period that we're into talking about. And when that lawless one will be revealed whom the Lord will slay with the breath of his mouth and bring an end by the appearance of his coming. We're talking about, we're talking about the Antichrist business. That is the one whose coming is accordance with the activity of Satan, that's the Antichrist, with all power and signs and false wonders and with all the deception of wickedness for those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth so as to be saved for this reason. God will send upon them to lose an influence uh, so that they might believe what is false. And then he goes on to make a, a bigger discussion about it. And what he's talking about, what he's talking about in this process is the second coming of Christ. We, we've talked about this recently when we did a study out of Daniel, if you remember, looking at uh, the tribulational period and how all this comes into being. And this is just, this is just part of that if you're not familiar with this, you should go back and enter our archives at doctrinalstudies.com and you can pick this information up. Last week uh, in our lesson, we studied seven parables and these seven parables are really important to our lesson because Jesus taught on this. Last week, you recall, we studied seven parables of Jesus out of the book of Matthew uh, and Jesus was teaching on this very subject with parables. And we looked at all those parables. One of those parables that we looked at because Jesus gave an explanation on it that helps us. And it's a really great parable for you to look at how he was teaching his parables was the parable of the wheat and the tares, if you remember. Uh, he taught the parable and his disciples said, could you explain it? And so he explains it. Remember, he explained two parables in Matthew 13. He did the parable of the sower and he did the parable of the wheat and tares. And you really learn how to study parables because he showed you how to do that. Well, when you, when you, um, when you go back to that, just go, let's go back just a moment with the tares and look at uh, 13. And we'll look at the explanation when I get to 13. Let's take a look at 13 and look at the explanation. Uh, I put on your paper uh, 36 through 43. Um, 13, that's 12, 13, 36. See, if you have a study Bible, it says the tares explained, right? You got a heading, you have a heading in your Matthew 13, 36? Should say something like that, right? Okay, I, I know my New American Standard does. It says the tares explained. Uh, he left the multitude, went to the house. The disciples said, we don't understand, so explain it. He said, the one who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. 
and the good seeds, these are the sons of the kingdom, and the tares are the sons of the evil one. In other words, he's going to show that there's two sowers, right? Two sowers and two seeds, okay? The enemy who sowed them is the devil, that he sows the tares, the son of man sows the good seed. Uh, when I was a kid on the farm, we called them weeds. <laughs> and they were always healthy. Didn't have to do anything to get a crop of them. Uh, the enemy who said them is the devil. And the harvest is the end of the ages, and the reapers are the angels. These are elect angels. This has everything to do with our study. Therefore, just as the tares are gathered up and burned with fire, this is part of our study, so shall it be at the end of the age. Right? And, and we know what he's talking about here. The Son of Man will send forth his angel. They will gather out of his kingdom all stumbling blocks and those who commit lawlessness and will cast them into the furnace of fire. In that place, furnace of fire, in that place, that's also called Gehenna. We call it the place of torment. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous, that's the good seed, will will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears, let him hear. So that's a great one on this very topic. This He was teaching on this very topic that we're on. Teaching on it. Uh, in verse 43, uh, going through that, he says, Allow both to grow together until the harvest, and in the end of the harvest I will say to the reapers, that's the elect angels, first gather up the tares, that's unbelievers, and bind them in bundles to burn them up. That's going to be the baptism of fire. But the wheat, the believers, take, put in my barn. That's the security of the believer. Okay. We talked about that last week. I'm just bringing it back to kind of remind you of this. And, and we dealt with, with seven parables that dealt with this. He was on this subject. Um, here's, a, here's point number two. All living unbelievers removed from the earth are sent to Sheol, to the place of torment, also known as Gehenna, or also known in the English as hell, until the great white throne judgment. They're going to be there until the great white throne judgment. Now, they're going to go to Sheol. We'll see in a moment. They're going to go to Sheol. That's the general name of where they're going, and Sheol has three divisions. So I want you to go to Ephesians with me. Let's go to Ephesians, the fourth chapter. And um, I want to show you where Sheol is. Now, the expression, he ascended, what does it mean except that he also descended into the lower parts of the earth? That's where he went in his burial. You remember that? Now, we've studied this in great detail. I'm just calling this to your attention. Descended into what? The lower parts of the earth. That's where Sheol is. That's, that's, we, Sheol is the Hebrew word. Hades is the Greek word. And hell is the English word. Okay? And... There are three parts, notice on your paper, but first I want to read to you Matthew 10, 28. Talking about the place of torment where the unbeliever goes is also called Gehenna or hell. He says, Matthew 10, 28, do not fear those who kill the body but are unable to kill the soul. That tells you a lot about where your true life really is about. Doesn't it? But rather fear him who was able to destroy both soul and body in hell, which is the word Gehenna. Let's say I put that down there for you. Now, most of you are familiar with this, but for those who aren't, Sheol is the Hebrew idea of, in Greek, Hades, or in English, hell three parts to it 
Abraham's bosom or paradise, that's where believers went prior to the resurrection of Jesus. For example, when Christ was on the cross and he had two, th two thieves next to him, right? There are three crosses uh, on, uh, at Calvary. He says to the one thief in Luke 23, 43, today, you remember after a conversation, today you will be with me in paradise. Okay? Paradise was also called Abraham's bosom. Like in Luke 16, 22, 23, the rich man dies and the beggar Lazarus. And they go to the place. One goes one place and one goes the other. The unbeliever, the rich man who was an unbeliever, went to the place of torment or Gehenna or hell. And Lazarus, the believer, went to paradise. And there was a gulf that separated them. And conversations and everything went on. Now, the interesting thing about that, we don't call that a parable, and it's not called that in the Bible. Do you know why? Because real, real people's names that people knew are identified. At least that's what some of us think. Now, the other place that's in this area, in this place, called Hades or hell is is a uh, or, or Hades as the location is a place called torment Gehenna or what we call hell Gehenna in the English is translated hell I refer to this place as a place of torment because of Luke 16 In Luke 16, 23, the rich man went there and was in torment. These people, an unbeliever, when he dies, this is where he goes. This is where unbelievers has, have always gone when they die. And they will remain there until the great white throne judgment when they will come out, be tried, right, under the great white throne judgment, and then will be cast into the lake of fire. What people call hell, Gehenna, is a temporary stay, right? Not permanent. It's temporary. It is until the great white throne judgment. They will be brought out. They will do that. And you'll see in a little bit. They will be, they will, Revelation, ah, let's just go. Revelation, now I know you know this, but probably some people don't. Revelation 20 we're going to look at Revelation 20, verses 14 and 15. And when we get to Revelation 20, we got the great white throne judgment. Right? Okay. See, so like start with verse 11. Right? We have the great white throne judgment. And death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. Okay. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And this whole thing is about the judge, the great white throne judgment of unbelievers. They're going to be brought out. They're going to go through the great white throne judgment. And at the end, they're going to be cast into a lake of fire. And that is forever. The, a place called hell or Gehenna is a temporary stay. You understand that? Holding pen. Yeah, it's a holding pen. There you go. Ron, you believe there's different degrees? No, I don't. No, I don't. I don't know. I don't know. I don't think so. I don't have any evidence in the Bible. Nothing to say it. No. No, there's nothing to say it. But I don't know why, because they're there because they rejected Christ. They will. It's not based on anything else. I mean, you, you don't go to hell because you're a bad person. You go because you rejected Jesus Christ. As far as we know, the rich man that wound up there thought he was a good guy. And probably most people that he donated to thought he was too. Do what? Your sins are already paid for. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you don't go to hell because it's a punishment for your sin. You go because you rejected Christ. Well, anyhow, and then there is Tataris. Um, 
You can read about that in 2 Peter 2, 4 and 5. That's where the fallen angels that were involved in the cause of the flood of the Antediluvian period, that's where they are. And, it, and a great read is Revelation 9, which we, we studied just recently in the past, that talks about this group of people and talks about their leader, Apollon. He has a name. We know his name, the leader of that group of Genesis 6. And they're going to be released at mid-trib, in the middle of the trib. When the abomination of desolation is set up in the temple, they're going to be released from there. And they're going to go back. And, they, and this is why the last three and a half years is called the Great Tribulation. And, and if you study as we did, we've gone through this. This occurs on what's called the fifth trumpet and the first of three woes. Uh, and we just recently did through all that through Daniel. Remember when we did our study through Daniel ninth chapter or whatever? Okay. Here's the third point. You know, people say to me all the time, Ron, how do you know this? Well, I, I drink a glass of warm milk at night, and I go to bed, and I dream. No, I get it from the Bible. You just study the Bible. You study categorically, and you're looking on a subject. You study everything you can get on it. You pull it together, and this is what you get. Now, the third point is that the elect angels will execute the divine judgment of Jesus' baptism of fire. In all in the parables, like in the parable we just studied, the wheat and tares, it tells you that, right? In verse 38. We just read that in verse 38. The angels will come. That's part of that, that team. In uh, Matthew 25, in the parable of the sheep and the goats, in verse 31, you have the angels doing it again, if, if you remember that. We just read that in 2 Thessalonians 1, uh, first, the first chapter. Well, I guess we didn't reread the, maybe the second chapter. But in the first chapter, yeah, we read the first chapter. In chapter 1, let me just get it. I think I, no, I don't. I want the revelation. Let me get 2 let me get second Thessalonians 1, 1, 7, and 8. Well, I wrote it on your paper, didn't I? I already typed it. Uh, to give relief to you who are afflicted and to us as well when the Lord Jesus will reveal from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, dealing out retribution to those who do not know God and to those who do not obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. See that? There you go. Okay? So the elect angels in this process are going to be part of that team, part of the team in the baptism of fire. What's the baptism of fire? It's all, all connected with the second coming of Christ and it's dealing with unbelievers. And it's, it's dealing with them once and for all, forever. So I don't, I don't think there are many people in the church that even understand the difference between Gehenna and the lake of fire. And what stands in between them is, a judge, is the great white throne judgment. So, you know, you, you look at the first one, you look at the second one, you look at the third one, you go like, ah, I get that. Well, yeah. You do, and that's what's important to me. Point number four. Torment, what, what I refer to as the place of torment or Gehenna or hell, is described by the following five characteristics. And I speak to those who go like, I don't think I need to believe the gospel of Jesus. I'm a good person. I go to church. I was raised to be a good person. Hey, let me tell you something. And this is for your benefit. Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins. That's Adamic sin. I'm not talking about personal sin. I'm talking about Adamic sin. That 13 judicial charges that you're under that you didn't commit that were committed for you. 
where, for example, spiritual death. Romans 5, 12 sets up this whole 13 judicial charges. For by one man, Adam, sin entered the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for all have sinned. All have sinned? How, how does that work? In Adam? In Adam, where we've all sinned in Adam. And the only way out of that is through the gospel of Jesus Christ. The only way out. Religion can't do it. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and life, and no man can come to the Father except through me. John 14, 6. It's, it's really important that we understand that. And listen, Christ is the only way out of that predicament. And the only way you can get through that predicament is to believe that Jesus came and died to remove that sin barrier, was buried and raised from the dead on the third day. When you believe it, that 13 judicial charges are removed because of the work of Christ. He paid the penalty for that. The punishment is over. There is no more. It's done, kaput, over and out. You will never go to hell because he has won that victory for you. But if you think you're going to get to heaven any other way than through faith in the gospel of Jesus, God, I don't mean you say, well, Ron, I believe that Jesus existed. I don't care. That doesn't save you. Well, God, I, is it Ron, I believe in God. The, the, the demons, these demons that are going to go to the lake of fire, they believe in God. They believe in God more than you do. They ain't going to get them there. You've got to believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if you don't, you're going to a place called Gehenna when you die. And I'm going to explain it to you. I'm going to tell you what it's going to be like to get there. Not because I've ever been there, because I studied the Bible. It says this is what it's like. So when you get there, you will know what to expect. I don't know any other reason why he would give you outlines like this. And here's the first. In Matthew, the eighth, in Matthew, the eighth chapter, this is really interesting because he contrasts two groups of people. In Matthew, the eighth chapter. In Matthew, the eighth chapter. I'm going to pick this thing up at verse five. He entered Caper when he entered Capernaum, a centurion, that's a Roman officer, came to him, entreating him, and he said, Lord, my servant is lying paralyzed at home, suffering great pain. He said to him, I will come and heal him. And he said to him, will you come and heal him? Jesus said to him, I will come and heal him. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy for you to come under my roof. Just say the word and my servant will be healed. For lo, I too am a man under authority with soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes. And to another, come, and he comes. And to my slave, do this, and he does it. Now, when Jesus heard this, he marveled, and he said to those who were following, truly I say to you, there's one of our deals. Truly I say to you, I have not found such great faith with anyone in Israel. Wow. And I say to you, that, now watch this. This is second, truly, truly. Now watch this. See, you missed that. Right? Truly I say to you, cha-ching. And again I say to you, cha-ching. You got that? And I say to you that many shall come from the east and west and recline at the table with Abraham, Isaac, Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the sons of the kingdom shall be cast out into outer darkness. In that place, there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And Jesus said to the centurion, go your way. Let it be done to you as you have believed. And the servant was healed that very hour. Now, here's my point. See, he contrasts the Gentile to the Jew. He said the Gentile is going to get in because they believe. The Jew is not going to get in because he doesn't believe. Oh, he's religious. <laughs> oh, he's religious. But religious is not what gets you saved. It's not what other people believe. It's what you believe that gets you saved. Mm. Now listen to what he said in verse 12. He said they will be cast into 
outer darkness in the place where there is weeping or wailing. I like the old King James. The King James call it wailing. Yeah. Weeping and gnashing of teeth. Okay. You will find this information as well in, uh, in two parables uh, in Matthew 22, 13 and 25, 30. You will also find this, interestingly enough, in uh, 2 Peter 2.17 and Jude 13. I'm going to go to Jude 13 because it's quicker for me to get there. I can get to Revelation and back up and there right there I am. Uh, to Jude. And I'm looking at Jude, um, what, 13, if I remember right. Yep, Jude, Jude 13. Jude 13. And he's talking about apostate teachers, wave, wild waves of sea casting upon their own shame like foam, wandering stars for whom, what says, black darkness has been reserved forever. Black darkness is the inability to see your hand in front of your face. If you've ever been into a dark cave, and I've said this before, and they shut the lights off, you have no sense of direction. There's no way you could ever figure out what way you came and gone. You, and and if, they, if they did what I, they did with us, they made us do a, a turnaround in a circle while we were down there, which was scary in itself. Because we, we went down in a, on a small path. That was really an interesting thing. And... Uh, and present the gospel down there. Yeah, presented the gospel down there. I was already a believer, thank God. <laughs> or I'd have done that thing all over again. If I'd have had any hesitation. And explained that, uh, explained, uh, that concept of outer darkness, black darkness. Oh, you go like, well, you know, I hear it's smart aleck kids. Oh, I'll be with my friends, my buddies. Yeah? Hmm. Come take a trip with, to me to DeSoto Caves. I'll cure that idea. That's right. Take him down there and turn the lights off. Now talk. Where, where are you? Hey, big guy. Where are you now? Because this is what that means. That's one thing. So if you think you're going to go down there and party with your buddies, you forget that idea. Forget that idea. You'd be hugging people down there you don't know and probably wouldn't hug them any other place. <laughs> Just so you can have a, find a way. Here's a second thing. It's called a fiery furnace. In the parable of, of Matthew 13, 42, as well as 49 and 50, you should add. 49 and 50. Your paper says 50. I'm saying 49 and 50. And Matthew, and Matthew 25, 41. The, in, Ma, in the Matthew 13, 42, uh, 49 and 50, he's doing an explanation um, in that Matthew uh, 13, 42. He's doing an explanation for you in the wheat and the tares. But in, when he gets to Matthew 13, 49 and 50, if you recall, well, we didn't do that one. Well, I only did seven of them. But he calls it the dragnet of the sea, you know, the dragging uh, nets that are being dragged trying to get fish. And he, and he talks about the good fish and the bad fish. Oh, I think we did do that. Yeah, we, did. we talked about the good fish and the bad fish. Well, see, that's, that's, that's what, uh, this is what the baptism of fire is, is dealing with all the unbelievers. Okay. So there's going to be the fiery furnace. That's, that's where they say they're all cast. And listen, wh wh why the fiery furnace? Actually, in Matthew 25, 41, it says because it was, the, it was prepared for Satan and his angels, right? And in the lake of fire, that's where they're all going to go. If you studied Revelation 20 further, right? Now, wailing and gnashing of teeth. We've, we, uh, listen, wailing and gnashing of teeth. You know, you can't see because of uh, utter darkness. Outer darkness or black darkness, you can't see.
But you know what? You can sure hear. We used to have a, a forest where I lived, uh, not right near me, but not too far, called Black Forest. And when I was a little boy, one of the first things my grandfather did was to take me into Black Forest because when you got into Black Forest any pretty good length, I don't care what time of day it was, it got dark. At night, it got brutal. And so my grandfather took me into Black Forest and explained to me how you could get out of it. He taught me about moss on the tree, taught me how to climb up in a tree and uh, focus on certain stars and listen to me and to listen. So he took me down in the daytime and that was, that was, it was okay. I, I, I don't know, I was probably eight. And then he took me down at night and we climbed up in that tree. And listen, I, I heard sounds at night, directional sounds at night. I never heard in the daytime. And one of them was the waves from Lake Michigan. I could hear them just as clear. I could hear the waves. And so my grandfather in the daytime, he told me, now what you do is you, you go west. You always go west. And it's going to bring you out to the beach on Lake Michigan. And when you get there, you can walk either direction, son. You can find us. But when you get out there, if you want to find us quicker, you go left. It's going to bring you back down to su such and such a place. I never heard any of that in the daytime, but at night. But so I heard other sounds I didn't hear in the daytime, too. That scared the fire out of me. I heard these sounds at night. And while they, they're going to lose their sight because of darkness, the hearing is going to pick up to be really sensitive. What I couldn't hear in the daytime, and he would say, be real quiet now. Listen really close. And what are you hearing? I, I you know, birds ch chipping and you know, chirping. I didn't hear nothing. You know, but at night, whoa. But anyhow. So what's really going to be keen down there is your sense of hearing, isn't it? All you're going to hear is wailing and gnashing of teeth. You having a good time now, buddy? You and your buddies are having a good time, aren't you? Huh? Oh, yeah, well, we, we'll party down there like we do here. <laughs> yeah. I got some news for you, buddy. Got some news for you. Then, the, that's the third. The fourth is eternal destruction. In Matthew 25, 45, 46, we've studied, it talks about the eternal, he compares eternal punishment to eternal life. Isn't that interesting? Yeah, that's well worth your read in there. He's going, to, he's going to contrast eternal punishment from eternal life. In other words, he's saying that when you go there, there is no life. It's all punishment. All. In Philippians 3, 18 and 19, he talks about the enemies of the cross whose end is destruction. This is the same word that's used for this idea. 2 Thessalonians, the first chapter 8 and 9, says, who, who's going to go there? He says, two groups. Those who do not know God and those who do not obey the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, if you shut down on God at God consciousness, then you don't get gospel hearing. If you say positive God at God consciousness, you get gospel hearing. He either brings the gospel to you or you to the gospel. That's a pretty amazing concept. The first time I heard that, I thought, I don't know. And then I thought, wait a minute, that's exactly what he did with me. That's exactly what he did with me. I don't know if I ever heard the gospel when, uh, until I moved to the South. If I did, I didn't pay any attention to it. I thought Jesus Christ was a swear word. I'd get my mouth washed out if I said that. 
So when I came to the South and people talked about Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, I thought, listen, first thing I'm going to do is teach you people how to swear. You don't know how to swear right. <laughs> and God dr drugged me all the way down to the South so I could get a clear hearing with all this distraction of all my buddies and the yada, yada, yada. Got me down here, got me quiet so I could hear. I had ears to hear. They have... I don't know if anybody shared it with me up there. I have no idea because I never heard it until I got here. You understand what I mean? I don't, just never, nothing rang a bell. When I got down here, I didn't ears to hear. I didn't have all that clutter around me. Here's one. Worms that never die. It, what kind of worms hang around dead people? So I don't know. If you think of these are fishing worms, forget that deal. The, and and how, who knows what that would be, right? Unquenchable fire. These are worms that live in unquenchable fire. I don't figure that out. I just don't like the idea of worms. The only thing I... I can't feel anything in the darkness except worms climbing on me. <laughs> Going, I want you. Uh, uh, in unquenchable fire. Unquenchable fire. Unquenchable fire. I, I, who would want to be in unquenchable fire? Oh, I don't mind. The tough guy. I'm going to hell. Let me tell you what happens when you get there. Luke 16 says... Go tell my brothers, this is the real deal. Believe in Jesus Christ. There are other options. Don't come here, right? Luke 16, well worth your read. And it tells us why we should be going, telling people about the gospel of Jesus Christ. These tough guys, there's no tough guys in hell. No, no tough guys. Yeah, you can be tough now. You can read about this in Mark 9, 44, 46, and 48. Hey, by the way, that's a quote out of, you know where that idea came from? I bet it's not on your paper. Isaiah, it ought to be. Isaiah 66, 24. That un, worms with unquenchable fire is found in Isaiah. What did I say? 66, that's right. Now, if you have a study Bible, it's probably in your footnotes. How about that? So I remind you, when you're studying stuff, you always look over your footnotes, right? Say, I wonder if it's, the, right? Is it, I, is it in your footnotes? Yeah, you got a good Bible. Thank you. Got a good study Bible. Now, here's my final point. You're going like, hooray. The final point. Oh, I know. Everybody here, everybody here. I know, I love you for that. Watch this now. Everybody talks about world wars. You know, right now, America's worried about North Korea and the world war and atomic this, atomic that. There are two wars you should worry about. But when they come, there won't be your worry to worry about. They're es eschatological, eschatological wars, world wars. Armageddon, Gog and Magog. Those are the ones you should worry about. Well, yeah. Yeah, but I meant it won't be in your, while your feet are on earth. Well, I guess. In your resurrection body. The World War of Armageddon will, will be the end of the Great Tribulation of the Jewish Age. If you want to read about it, you can read about it in Revelation 16, 13 through 16. All unbelievers will be removed for the Millennial Age. Baptism of fire. At the end of the Millennial Age, you're going to have the, the World War of Gog and Magog. Revelation 27 through 10, Ezekiel 38, 39. All unbelievers removed for the Great White Throne Judgment. In preparation for the new heaven and new earth, Revelation 20 through 22. Okay? There will be two great world wars. 
Now, I put a few points down here, but I think well worth your read. For example, in Matthew 24, 6 through 8, Jesus gives us let one of these, let not your hearts be troubled passages. In Matthew 24, 6 through 8, he tells us there will be wars and what? Rumors of wars. There will be nations against nations. But this is not yet the end, right? We live in that period. Look, in your lifetime, I've never known a period where we haven't been at war or rumor of war, right? In my lifetime. I mean, I got drafted on the end of one war and preparing us because another one was already rattling. Uh, on the backside of Korea, and Vietnam was heating up. Now, I got caught, I, I got drafted in that between stage. And sure enough, m I've never known. And my grandparents were the same way. Nation against nation. And he goes into this whole discussion. You know what that is? That dress rehearsal is a dress rehearsal for what is coming after the rapture. It's a dress rehearsal. Listen, we see, we miss, we miss verses like verse 6 and 8 of Matthew 24. Not yet the end, but the beginning of birth pains. Then you get into Matthew 24 in verses 15 through 20, and he talks about mid-triff, mid-tribulation, mid and he says, watch out, because here's the big sign. The abomination of desolation. You remember that? And it goes like, look, boy, when that happens, run for the hills. And listen, when you study that passage, pay attention to two words. Now, this is really important. When you go in there and study these words, pay attention to the word when, then. Pay attention to the word when and pay attention to the word then. When this occurs, then this when this, you understand? So pay attention to that when you go in there. Be sure to pay attention because in verse 15, he's going to say when, and then, then 16, 21, 23, he's going to say then, then, then. See, I'm just, and, and you, know where that, you know where this abomination and desolation comes from in the scripture? Daniel, the book of Daniel, ninth chapter, verse 27, if you have a study Bible. In Matthew 24, verses 21 through 28, he talks about the Great Tribulation, which is the last three and a half years. It's called the Great Tribulation. And in verse 21, watch what he says in verse 21. He says, and there will be such as never since the beginning of the world. When you read about the tribulation, the tribulation of the seven years and what God does, I mean, he throws stuff out of heaven. I mean, he just... I mean, he's just cleaning up, throwing everything out. It's amazing. He said, what's going to happen then is never been since the beginning of the world. Boy, a whole lot of stuff has gone on. Think about that. And uh, if you have a study Bible, you're going to see the, a reference to Daniel 12, chapter verse 1. In Matthew 24, boy, look what the, all is in Matthew 24. In Matthew 24, 29 through 31, there are two key words or phrases. Now, listen to me. Sometime you're going to go in there and read that. And I gave you an outline. In verses 29 through 31, it says, immediately after the great tribulation. That's a big point. And because we're talking about the second coming of Christ and signs in the sky. Signs in the sky. And if you have a study Bible, they're going to refer you back to Acts 2, 19 and 20, and Joel, the second chapter, verse 10. Signs in the sky of the coming of Christ. Second coming. Well. They what? Mm-hmm. Yep. Yep. Great white throne is after that. Yep. 
They're going to be there till the great white throne. So what's the bottom line before we leave? What's the bottom line? Here's the bottom line. The gospel. You know why, you know why it's called good news? Because I just gave you all the bad. <laughs> I'll tell you one thing. You do not want to go. You say, wow, I'm a tough guy. I can make it. Mm. Nah, don't do that. Don't do that. Come, on to, come to Jesus. Believe that he, went, he died on that cross for your sins personally. Was buried and raised from the dead third day. You do not want to die without Christ. You do not. Listen, it's, you don't want to live without him, let alone die without him. Gary? I'll be in Florida next week. All next week. Uh, is that the prison system? Or? That's part of it. Part of it? And, Friday, and, I'll be in the, one of the largest federal pens in Florida. Right. That's wonderful. Well, we'll sure remember that in prayer, Gary. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Yep. Let's pray. Listen, if you're with us tonight, even at home or wherever you are, I'd like to have you bow your head like our people are here and close your eyes and spend a moment in darkness. This is a darkness you can change because in a moment we're going to open our eyes and we're back in the light. But listen, if you die without Christ, this is going to be your life forever. It's going to be your life forever. This is not a darkness. You can open your eyes and it was just a bad dream or I, I'm back. This is forever. Don't do that. I don't care what other people told you you had to do to be saved. Let me tell you the absolute truth. Jesus Christ came in this world to die on a cross for your sins, be buried and raised from the dead. If you believe it, you're saved. If you don't believe it, you're not. Don't let the devil lie to you and send your soul to where he's going. Believe. What do I have to do, Pastor? You have to believe the gospel and that it has the power to save you. You don't have the power to save yourself, and I don't have the power to save you. But the gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes Romans 1.16. And so, our Father, we've, we've told them what it's going to be if they don't believe. All that tough guy, I don't think Ron is right. was the alternative. When it cost you nothing here today to believe, I didn't ask you to do up anything. I didn't ask you to join nothing, give me anything. Suppose I'm right and you're wrong. That's what old man, the old evangelist John Hagee, I said to me. Suppose I'm right and you're wrong. I've told you what the Bible says. It hadn't been my opinion. You can read it for yourself. I gave you every scripture. Every scripture I declared, I gave you. Go study it yourself. But I'm telling you, when the Holy Spirit convicts you to believe, you believe. And you will be saved and your life will be transformed and changed. I promise you that. You will be born again and the Spirit will take up residence in your life. And the Spirit of God will shed abroad or pour out within your own heart the love of God as you've never known it. Romans 5.5. 5. Because in Romans 5.8, God has demonstrated his love towards you in that while you were a sinner, Christ died for you to bring you into sainthood. That's a gift. So, Father, we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.